So today we're going to be doing the third piece of kind of thinking about linear regression. Um, we're more and more kind of pushing up against the constraints of what we can do for kind of the types of questions we're interested in with pure kind of standard regression format without introducing kind of some of the research design approaches that we're going to be studying in the second half of the course. So think IV regression discontinuity, et cetera. So for now, um, you know, we're still not going to be touching on that, but we're going to get to this. And this is kind of trying to show you another useful way of thinking about um, more broadly treatment effects and more generally um, other types of robust estimators. Um, sounds like about half of you or a little more than half of you have seen some version of this before. So some of it may be review, but kind of hopefully tying this into some of the stuff we've talked about at the beginning of the course will be valuable. So Oh, and sorry, and some housekeeping. Um, I'm going to try and post the solutions today. For doing these slides has actually been a lot more time consuming than I expected. Hopefully post the solutions today and post a new problem set tonight. If I don't post it, it isn't that you missed the memo. It's probably that I still haven't gotten to it, um, but I'm going to try and do it. I can't imagine anyone here is desperately waiting for me to put up problem sets. But if you are, I apologize. Um, yeah, that's the only housekeeping to keep in mind. Um, okay, so, sorry. Um, let's start with just like a very brief refresher on OLS. So this is really kind of like a GMM thing more generally, thinking about minimization in least squares, but OLS is kind of the easiest way to frame this. Um, so, Remember the OLS stands for the ordinary least squares method. It's really just least squares, LS. And it's minimizing the sum of squared errors, right? So say we have some conditional expectation model that we're asserting is linear in X. Then what we can do is we define this beta hat least squares as the minimizer of this sum of squared errors. And usually we have an N hanging around, but it doesn't really matter. This is just a, in finite samples, the N is just a scaling term. Um, and this is kind of how we denote it in, in matrix notation, which is this nice quadratic um, objective function. And so what this is trying to do, right, is it's trying to find the minimum of these. And so it's a, it's a squared objective function. And so it's, it's, you know, it has a minimum we know kind of it has these nice properties and we can talk about um, the optimum of these uh, of this objective function. So in this case, what's really nice about least squares, and I think everyone's kind of aware of this, is that you can take the derivative. This is an objective function that you can specify with respect to beta. And so you say, great, let's take the derivative with respect to beta. Let's find the optimum and solve for that beta. So what do we do when we're trying to do that? Well, remember, we take the objective function, we take the derivative. So we take the derivative with respect to beta. Um, in this context, you know, I'm doing it with matrix notation just so that we get the familiar um, term. So we get this minus x prime y minus x beta hat equals zero. That's what we're solving for is where the optimum is. We distribute and we add and then we multiply um, by the matrix inverse. This, this is, shouldn't be that parentheses there, but then you get this very nice analytic Form. So the least squares does a lot of work for us um, by creating a nice subjective function, not just that, but also the fact that the model is linear, right? So the fact that we're linear in our parameter makes it easy. If this had been some nonlinear um, conditional expectation, then we wouldn't have been able to solve for it directly and we would have had to use a numeric method. Um, so there's a lot of, that's sort of when we talk about nonlinear least squares, that's what we talk about. We specify some function here, there's some beta that we want to do and we're minimizing squared errors. So the least squares is really helpful in the sense that it makes it easy to do this, taking the derivative and kind of it, it comes out directly. The gradient is, is just linear in the parameters, but it's also the fact that it's a linear model that gets us such a clean um, solution. The, the other thing that this quadratic objective function, so this, uh, this quadratic objective function isn't just making it easy for us to do calculus, kind of the other it has some other properties, right? So by being squared, right? So it's a squared loss function. So I'm just going to start sort of some of the terminology you'll say is this is a squared loss function, or you might call it the L2 norm. 
So there's certain, you're putting certain norms on your, on your objective function, which is kind of the distance that you're um, allowing from two things. And the kind of key idea is that the squared loss function leads to pretty heavy penalization from outliers. So big outliers tend to have a lot of influence in the sense that you, because it's squared for every point, like kind of every additional increment that you go further away, that kind of continues to have a, a quadratic effect on your objective function such that your optimized, your optimized solution is gonna really try to do its best to minimize those errors. So things far away from your answer are gonna have big weight and gonna push down, um, have, an, have a big influence. And we'll get into formally what I mean by that. But I think intuitively everyone under, understands that idea. The second thing that's kind of interesting about OLS that's very nice is that it's a local approximation to the conditional expectation function. So we've talked about this a little bit, but right? But OLS is basically finding the linear model that is the closest potential fit of that model to the conditional expectation function. So you can show that when you do OLS with some linear function, OLS is literally trying to find the beta that minimizes the distance between the line and the conditional expectation function based on some squared error. So it's, it's locally approximate and which is great. We like that property of it in the sense that while we say, might say that we're not doing a perfect job, we're doing the best that we possibly can. It's the best, um, the line of best fit. And it's kind of one of these, when we talked about last time is, you know, OLS does well in part because it's it, not that it's the best, but it's the least bad of all the potential options if you're gonna do something. And then another really nice part, right, is that we said that OLS gives us an estimate of the average treatment effect when we're running um, a regression. We can basically run a regression and it's going to spit out something that's going to approximate the average treatment effect without having to do kind of um, anything special with propensity scores or whatever else. It'll give us kind of this variance weighted estimate. So that's, that has a lot of very nice properties of OLS. Um, the kind of other key feature, which is maybe sounds obvious, is that from what we're going to, but what's important for what we're going to talk about today is it's characterizing features of the average of our outcome variable. So conditional on covariates, like the treatment, it's gonna really give us conditional expectations, conditional means, conditional on covariates. Um, that's the whole idea is that because it's approximating this conditional expectation function, it's gonna try and give us um, a good approximation of what those the CEF looks like. So a natural, this kind of gives two very natural pivot points to what we're gonna talk about today, which is, there's kind of two branching paths of how you can kind of reflexively have issues with OLS. Um, one is like, what if we care about other things? Like we don't care just about the mean, right? We care about other distributional aspects. That's a very natural thing to say is there's, it's, it's an interesting question to say, well, why do we focus so much on the mean? And then the second is to say, well, if we're focusing on means independent of kind of the in, interpretation question is, we know that there are certain aspects of means that are problematic. Um, one that we I mentioned briefly is about this influence, kind of this sensitivity to outliers. And then the other one is that I will also talk on is kind of the extent to which Jensen's inequality holds. So the extent to which trans nonlinear transformations of outcome variables um, are non-trivial. So those are kind of gonna motivate what we're gonna talk about and is why we're interested in quantile regression more generally. So before we kind of jump into the two ways to think about this, let me do some setup on thinking about quantile regression. So, and people should stop me if there's something that's confusing. We're gonna have a lot more math on the page today in part, in part because I don't know this literature quite as well. So it's a little more of a crutch for me. Um, in part, it's also easier to kind of keep track of what's going on because it's a little less intuitive. So the first thing to kind of um, remember is sort of, we're gonna be sitting in this space of thinking about um, cumulative, uh, cumulative distribution functions, so CDFs. So take a random variable X, we can talk about its CDF, so that's its F function. And then really what we care about is 
when we're thinking about quantiles is we say, okay, well, let's think about the inverse of that function. So the inverse, what you can define it as is it's the infimum value of X such that it basically, you hit the quantile that you're, you're interested in. So, you know, the median here would be saying the smallest value of X such that all the, the, all the values above X, um, that the value of X is greater than or equal to 0.5, right? So that's like a very unwieldy way of saying that what you wanna find is the point that's in the center um, in, where such that all the values below and above, it's, a, it's roughly in the middle of um, the conditional, the, excuse me, the CDF. So you have this infimum thing to kind of deal with ties um, in a continuous like smooth thing, this wouldn't be an issue. There would just be a single value um but basically the easiest way to think about this is so tau equals 0.5 is the median right so hopefully actually one thing that's worth having up just so people can see it is because sometimes this is confusing it's like imagine or we'll, we'll have a picture of this later but imagine that this is f of x and this is um x then it goes from zero to one right and it looks and that's what I, I usually CDF looks something like this. And so then, right, the inverse function is the, is the thing that finds the value of X such that it's the smallest value of X such that it's at 0.5, right? That's like, I think everyone understands the intuition behind um, doing a quantile regression, but it's helpful to kind of look at the picture because you're always doing this inversion um inversion game so now you can start to talk about loss functions so um really the way to think about the loss function is this two piece and well the easiest way to look at the loss function is this graph on the right so this is the way of what a quantile um loss function is doing so imagine how was 0.5 then what it would be is it would look like the absolute value function, right? So you'd have a slope of 0.5 here, a slope of 0.5 here, and it would just be increasing. It would be a line of y equals x or y equals minus x. And so that's what this loss function is doing for the median. It's saying for the for tau equals 0.5, we're, a lot, we're saying that the loss function is um, the absolute value. You can, if you have tau be different values, then you are going to be kind of penalizing one side more than the other. So say now uh, tau was uh, 0.75, then one side is gonna be much steeper than the other, right? So the, the side on the right is gonna have a much steeper line and the side on the left is gonna have a less steep line, which it means that it's gonna penalize positive values more and negative values less. The thing I, I wanted to draw a picture on top of this, but I, I didn't end up having the time, but the thing to look at this loss function is contrast this loss function with what a quadratic loss function looks like. So the key behind a quadratic loss function, right, is that it's very, it's relatively flat early on and then it goes off, it's quadratic. So it, it has um, positive curvature. And so as a result, initially it's gonna put potentially less weight on errors and then it will pull much more um, as you go further out. Whereas the idea behind this kind of check function is that what it's doing is it's putting kind of equal weight on errors across um, across the distribution. So the nice thing about this is we're not we are not going to really do too much on loss functions, but it's an interesting thing that there are a lot of ways to think about loss. Um, expected loss. Um, we talked. We already did this when we were thinking about expected quadratic loss. Well, if you do this for um, with this function here, we can talk about, okay, well, what's the expected loss of this for some mu hat? So say here, we use this rho tau function as our loss function. So it's gonna be this thing on the right. And we wanna say, we wanna find the thing that, that we're gonna talk about the expected loss um, over a random variable given some estimator mu hat. So what we'll be doing then is we'll take the expectation um, over this piece. So Let's just walk through the math very carefully because I think this is helpful to see. Remember up here, you have your loss, your loss function rho is equal to u tau 
and then an indicator function for u being greater than zero. So that's the right hand part of this. It's just increasing up, it's just y equals x, right? And then on the left, when u is negative, it's y equals negative x. So this loss function then is gonna be saying, okay, well, for values of x greater than mu hat, so that's from uh, mu hat to infinity, then we're gonna be integrating over, so just u times tau. And so u is the random variable, so that's here. And then tau is on the outside. And we're just going to then say, like integrate that value x over this. And then for the other one, well, it's saying for all values from negative infinity up to mu hat, we're gonna be integrating here, right? Cause it's only for the ones of u less than zero. So it's the values for which x, um, capital X is less than mu hat. So we're gonna be integrating over that separate part. So it's, it's saying as when you get deviate from it, you're either putting tau onto one side and integrating over it, or tau on the other side and integrating over it. If tau is equal to 0.5, then it's putting equal weight on both of these and it's just weighting the two equivalently. If tau is greater than 0.5, then it's gonna put more weight on these ones, on these arrows on the upside versus the downside. Any questions on that? Hopefully this is relatively clear. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, really kind of the, the idea here is to give you the analogy that, well, with this simple version of this, if you wanna find the value of mu hat that minimizes this expected loss, it's literally the quantile for x of tau. So we have some row defined for tau. For tau equals 0.5, the mu hat that would minimize this is literally the, me um, the median. So if tau was 0.75, it would be the 75th percentile, et cetera. So you can do this with calculus. It's not super challenging to do it. Um, and you can kind of show that this is exactly the kind of the same property here. You just need to take the derivative with respect um, to these. So, you know, this basically, we've done this just for a quantile. Um, this is really kind of a place in which it's pretty obvious where you want to go with this next, right? So imagine now we want to generalize this problem. We could say, okay, well, let's define some uh, conditional quantile function. So we're going to call it Q, where Q tau is the quantile of Y conditional on X. Right, so we're now talking about properties of Y conditional on X, which is fine. That's like what we were doing with the conditional expectation, right? We were, instead of talking about quantiles there, we were talking about the means, but that's just a distributional characteristic, right? So once we're sitting in that space, that makes it pretty easy. We say, okay, well, we have something here. We're now gonna talk about you know, the same properties that we would have before. We're gonna pick a function here that looks like this, which is it's, and we're gonna say that this function is the one that minimizes the distance between y and q of x, where we're minimizing over these qx functions, given this loss function. Just in the same way that we said, okay, well, conditional expectation function, that sounds complicated. It sounds infinite dimensional. We don't know how to estimate it in all cases. What if we approximate it with a linear model? And you can see obviously where we're going with this, right? So we can say, all right, well, let's plug in X beta. So we have X prime beta. And now we can say, we call this beta tau. So we're calling these as functions of tau because we may be interested in multiple versions, um, multiple values of this. But this is basically what we are saying here. This is the best linear predictor under the row loss function. So now we have a new loss function that we define this over. And this is the best linear predictor. What's interesting is that there's a really nice property from this paper by um, Angrist, Chernozikov, and uh, Fernandez, Fernandez Val, um, 
and for, in Econometrica in 2006, which shows basically that this linear model, this X prime beta tau, is basically the weighted least squares approximation to the unknown conditional quantile function. So remember how we economists love OLS because we're like, you know what? We don't know the true conditional expectation function, but we know it's a local approximation. So what we can do in what we can do now is kind of in a similar spirit with this quantile function is we can say, well, this quantile regression is actually, we don't know the true conditional quantile function. It's complicated. But we know that this linear model that we're doing is this weighted least squares approximation to it, where it's basically the thing that's minimizing the distance between the square distance between X prime beta and the conditional quantile function, where the weights are basically what are called importance weights. And that's their term from their paper, where what it's doing is it's averaging over the distance between the true conditional um, quantile function and the linear approximation within a given value. And then it's weighting the X's um, depending on the density of, of the X's. So certain values are gonna get more value um, over others. So that's a really nice property of this, what we're gonna get into now, which is thinking about, all right, let's think about minimizers of this loss function here that are thinking specifically uh, about a regression that's minimizing the picking the beta that is minimizing um, basically finding the lines that cross through certain quantiles in the error distribution. Any questions so far? Okay. So how is this solved? So we're really not going to get into it in part because it's sort of challenging to, to do intuitively. And I haven't actually ever programmed it myself. Conceptually, the thing to keep in mind is so unlike in OLS, there's no direct analytic solution for beta tau, right? So there's this solution problem. It's got a nicely defined objective function. It's a numerical minimization problem where you're trying to find, um, the thing that minimizes these errors, but it's not something where you can just kind of back out an analytic solution. What you can do, kind of the key insight um, of what you can do is you can redefine this as a simplex programming problem. So you can define it as a linear programming problem. And as a consequence, there are a lot of really nicely defined computer programs that solve this analytically, or not analytically, solve this numerically very fast. Not as fast as OLS, but still do a, a reasonably good job in computing time. If you think about the problem is that, you know, when even thinking about the median, what we think about it as doing is that if we don't think about it as an optimization problem and we instead just think about what the median is, what we wanna do is we just sort the values until we find, and then we'd sort of sort them and then we'd go down to the middle value and that would be our median. The problem with that is that then you have to go through every single observation to do it. And as you let your observation set get large, sorting it can be very computationally expensive. And so what these optimization problems do is redefine the problem such that they're not actually having to resort everything, but rather just um, defining an optim a gradient such that you can actually find um, the optimum. So like I said, we're not gonna get into the details of this. In my, in my words, is others have suffered for us in this. If you really are interested in the computational aspects of this, um, Conqueror's book, this is Conqueror's book. If you end up getting to the, this was my beach read, my third year summer in graduate school, um, talks about it. It's good. It's interesting. Um, there's also Conquer and Bassett's 1978 paper um, in Econometrica also details some very high level uh, discussion of it as well. So let's talk about a little bit of the properties of this just so that we can start to highlight um, what are some of the issues that come up um, in quantile regression. So, cause this is gonna be kind of part of the reason why um, it's challenging to use it in practice. So part one is 
let's stick with it and just thinking about the variance of a quantile. So a median, for example. So let um, psi tau be the sort of the inverse value. So it's the, you know, it's the tau -th quantile and it has some density. So um, we can talk about the density distribution of this. Um, right, so this is just, this is just the, the density version of the CDF. We can talk about, um, we can make some, uh, this is some quantile, we can talk about estimating that quantile and we specifically wanna understand the limiting properties of the quantile estimator. So basically the trick behind this comes from thinking about um, the contribution that, what, so when we wanna think about the limiting properties of our estimator, the intuition behind this comes from thinking about as we, what is the sampling process for our underlying variables? So we have some true quantile and then we have some actual value of it. Well, if you think about what's happening when we have more sampling, more sample and we're pinning down our, our estimate is that the, we're gonna get closer and closer to it as a function of getting more observations that pin us down around the right value. So for very extreme quantiles, we're gonna have relatively limited number that go on one side versus the other. So if you think about the 99th percentile, there's only a few observations that are gonna, there are gonna be relatively few observations that go on one side of the quantile versus on the other. Versus on the median, it's going to bounce around more. Basically, the way to think about the convergence of the estimate is that the variability of your estimate is coming from a series of coin flips about whether um, data points are above or below uh, the, true the, the true quantile estimate. So when we write down our, our gradient and the probability, specifically the probability of where our value sits, this turns into basically the summed value of a bunch of Bernoulli's. And so then these very nice sort of central limit theorems kick in where conceptually all this is, is just, it's talking about, well, we have many, many coin flips that get us close to the um, pinning us down at a particular value. Turns out that those estimates are just normally distributed around um, that estimate. And the way that they're normally distributed is that they're distributed as a function of tau times one minus tau and then divided by the density of uh, the estimate squared. So the density of the, basically if you take the density of the data set and you evaluate it at the, um, the estimate, it's a function of how dense it is. So the, the smaller the density, the kind of the higher the variance, and vice versa, if there's a lot of mass there, there's gonna be a smaller variance. If you take the non-IID form of this in the regression case, it's going to look very similar to what was things we're basically familiar with. So this is saying, say we want to do robust standard errors. Well, what we're going to have is we're going to have our estimator here, beta hat. This is what we talked about before. This is our beta hat coming from um, conditional quantile effects, uh, conditional quantile um, regression, linear regression. The distribution of this is going to be distributed, same thing as, as before, as this tau one minus tau. And then we're gonna have these three pieces. We're gonna have uh, HN inverse, JN, HN inverse, where the real piece that matters is this X prime X, and then the density of these chi i's at, at each point. So what this is gonna do, this is exactly that sandwich estimator when we did robust standard errors two classes ago. So when we were talking about allowing for robust standard errors, we, had, we need to allow for this same kind of covariance between the XIs and the XIIs. But the trick is now is that it's a function not of the XIs, but actually this underlying density. So let me back up for a second because I, I think there's kind of a big jump of what I described. So. First, I was saying, let's think about the properties of the, like say the median. And we want to talk about what is the sampling distribution. So I get an estimate for the median. The way I would get an estimate for a median, right? Is I would take a data set, I'd sort it. I'd find the thing at the uh, 50th percentile. And I want to talk about, well, what is the statistical properties of that estimate? Um, and how do I talk about say confidence intervals around that estimate? What? under kind of very simple assumptions where you have IID data, for example, 
um, what you can show is that the S that estimate basically has a variance that is a function of where it sits in the distribution. So whether or not it's like the median versus it's the 99th percentile and what the density of the data looks like. So it's kind of two pieces trading off. As you might imagine, the median is going to be much noisier than the 95th percentile, right? So think about the median. The median is 0 .0, uh, 0.5. So 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.25. Well, the 90th percentile is 0 0.9 times 0 0.1. That's 0 0.09. So it's substantially, this value is substantially smaller for a, um, a quantile that's out in the extremes. And so the implication there is actually the variance of the estimate is smaller um, for the for the extreme parts of the distribution rather than the median. Why would that be? For, given this part, why would that be? Well, it's because you actually have a lot more certainty about the um, the estimate out in the tail because it it doesn't move around as much as a result of the fact that you know you get the 90th percentile, you're getting very, relatively limited number that are going above it for any given draw. It's already the 90th percentile. You're not going to get very many that are out on the right-hand part of the tail. On the flip side, though, is that you're also not getting very many draws out there. So it's scaled by the density squared. And so when you have limited mass out in the tails, then you're going to get a basically a, um, a, a really large increase in your um, in your variance because the density is small at that part of the uh, part, that part of the distribution. A really useful thing to think about is imagine we were thinking about the following example. This is like trick questions in your asymptotic statistics class. Is imagine we had we were kind of thinking about we had a, a uniform distribution where we were sampling data over uniform distribution, but we didn't know what A and B were. And so then we wanna talk about distributional characteristics in the tail. Well, it turns out because the density is flat that the further out you go, basically the more and more precise your quantiles are gonna get, right? Cause you get a lot of data over here and then you also are getting less data on one side versus the other. So you start to really pin down the extremes much faster than you do um, anything in the middle. And what's notable is kind of the, the limiting case of this is that um, the A and B, the estimates for A and B are actually not distributed root N. So if you remember your asymptotic statistics, we're kind of doing this central limit theorem root N distribution. For a uniform distribution like this with A and B unknown and you want to estimate B, it actually converges much, much faster than root N. And so this would kind of collapse to a point um, if you were doing this for tau equals one, for example. So anyway, this is just a useful, this is kind of like a weird stylized example that highlights the trade-off here, which is that you've got these tau, which are going to be the where in the tail, where you're trying to estimate it of this value, but then you also have this density problem. I know there's a lot of technical detail. Um, kind of conceptually, all I'm trying to get you at to think of is, is this tension when you're thinking about estimating estimates and it's gonna show up in your quantile regression, which is that there's this trade-off between estimating things, um, say at the 90th percentile, which is going to be easier in part because it's at the extremes, but then there's less data there because it's, um, because it's because the density is, is smaller and that's gonna increase your variance. And that the same thing shows up when doing the regression version of it. Um, the last piece that is substantially more important and is kind of the, in my mind, is the Achilles heel of this approach is this F is a density, right? So it's a density. So it's, you know, it's some function that we don't know that we need to estimate in order to do this which really creates problems because you say, okay, well, I don't, how do I estimate that? And so really what you have to do is you have to do one of two things. One is you use kernel methods. So you do non-parametric methods to estimate this density. And there are ways to do that and approximate it. 
or you bootstrap to get basically an approximation to these standard errors. Um, what this does though, is it just adds a huge amount of computing time to estimating these things. It, the betas themselves are not challenging, but estimating this, the standard errors tend to be quite um, time consuming. Not to be a downer about it. It's just, it, that's like a serious constraint in a lot of contexts. All right, so let's talk about some properties of quantile regression though that are really powerful that um, are worth highlighting. So. I, before I move on, is everyone okay with that? I know there's kind of like a lot of math that I was spied in there. Is everybody sort of comfortable with the idea of what I'm saying? The variance term kind of conceptually has this odd, a few odd properties. The biggest one being you need to estimate this density, but then the second one being this trade-off between the, the tau's. And then the other aspect is just to remember that it's this approximation of the conditional quantile function. Okay. So let's talk about some properties of quantile regression. Um, and this is sometimes, some of these properties are true of OLS as well. They're not true of all linear models or all models, or sorry, not of all models. They're true of OLS, linear models, and quantile regression. So consider something like Y equals X beta plus epsilon. So one feature that we, we don't really appreciate, but is a is a thing is that we have what's called square, square ugh, scale equivariance. So what's nice is that, you know, rescaling Y, so doing Y in terms of thousands of dollars, right? All it does is it, it just rescales our beta hats. So this is something we always appreciate about our estimates, but it isn't always necessarily the case. So we have scale invariance. We have something called shift invariant equivariance, which is that adding Y, adding to Y some amount X gamma, basically just adds this aspect to which your estimate at, picks up this additional additive component such that it's now, um, sorry, this should just be gamma, not X. Um, so it should be beta hat plus gamma. So it's, all it's basically saying is that, you know, if you add some additional scale value that's proportional to the, the covariate that you have on the right, that's just going to juice up the coefficient that you pick up. And then you can, there's something called equivariance to reparameterization of design. So that's just a long-winded way of saying that if you do um, linear combinations of your, of your functions, or if you re, um, redefine your functions, that you just get new linear combinations of the coefficients. It doesn't change any of the underlying um, interpretation. So why is that useful? So this property is like what we exploit when we do different versions of like difference in difference. So the fact that we can talk about the level and then interact things and talk about the additive difference of across them versus doing each one period by period, the fact that we can redesign our coefficients, our design matrix, however we want, that's equivariance to reparameterization of design and doesn't always hold in all models. Okay, so these three things, these first three things are true in OLS. They're not I'm not selling you anything new that ha doesn't exist in your um, in your current tool set. The next two are pretty powerful aspects of quantile regression. And so the first one is equivariance to monotone transformations. So if, if monotone transformation sounds like a fancy word, really the thing is when somebody says that you just think logs. So what it means is imagine you have some function H, which is monotone like logs, well, it turns out that the quantile of the distribution of the logs is equal to the log of the quantile um, of the original distribution, right? It's basically this point that if I reshift something with a um, monotone transformation, where I sit in the distribution is just shifted in the same way. And that doesn't happen for OLS, right? So you think about Jensen's inequality the fact of the matter is, is that, I mean, this is, I'll just write it because it's always worth, it's always worth writing Jensen's inequality, which is that, remember that the log of E of Y is not the same thing as the E of log of Y, right? And so 
that changes kind of your interpretation of what the coefficients mean with OLS, but that isn't the case for your quantile regression. Basically, you can shift your parameters um, using the transformation and it has, it doesn't, it won't meaningfully affect your interpretation. The second thing is that the influence function of for quantile regression and just for quantiles more generally is bounded with respect to y. And this isn't the case for OLS. So outliers can have unlimited influence. So what I mean by influence function, um, I'm not going to get into the technical aspect of it, but there's a way to talk about how if I took a data point, say I had some y variable in my regression and I just kept moving it upwards, what would happen to my estimate, right? So say I have some um, scatter plot and I plot the line of best fit using OLS in it. And then I just took one of the data points and I just kept shifting it upwards. OLS would continue to follow that line basically until it went all the way up. You could take it all the way to infinity, right? In the limit. And that's because it's, it's, it's forced to by the fact that it's a squared loss function. It's, it's always trying to minimize these big errors. And so if you take this thing with it, um, it will continue to go with it. In the case of the quantile regression, it doesn't do that. So if you take the median quantile and you move one of the values up, it's not gonna shift it at all. It's basically has bounded, um, bounded influence. And so that makes it very robust outliers. So why are those properties useful? Well, for one, skewed variables really kind of are less pro problematic in quantile regression. So you don't have to worry about, well, am I doing logs or levels or what's kind of the right interpretation here? More generally, outliers are less problematic. And so it, it's kind of much more robust way to estimate problems. So for any of you who are working on things that have to do with like investment or you're worried about costs or things that are, you know, that start at zero and go to the right and are, um, Right distributed. Oh, my dog just pushed the door open. Okay. Hey, base. Um, sorry. I just want to make sure. My dog is blind, so I want to make sure he doesn't knock everything over. Um, and um, so things that are right skewed in that way are, are going to have serious uh, potential um, influence on OLS and won't affect uh, quantile regression. So the second thing is censoring, which is really, this is kind of really powerful as well. Uh, it depends on who you talk to, but if you have issues where your data is bottom coded or top coded, in OLS, this can have a serious issue. It really affects your interpretation. So think like wages, say you got a data set where all the values were top coded at $100,000 or at a million dollars. You would really be worried about the interpretation of your OLS coefficient. In quantile regression, this really doesn't matter so long as those kind of top coded values are not part of the quantile function that you're trying to estimate. So if you're doing the median and it's just those outlier values at the top, it doesn't matter if you cap them or if you let them be their true values, they wouldn't have had an effect anyway. And so this can really be powerful um, for data sets where you have these types of issues. It makes it very robust. Another one where this is valuable too, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but I may discuss it in the duration slides is when you're thinking about um, hazard modeling, this comes up as well. So for any of you who are interested in kind of um, modeling um, kind of like exit or duration models, this is going to show up as a potential issue. So let's look at an example. Um, you know, 45 minutes in, we can finally do an example. So let's think about kind of a classic canonical um, relationship, which is like the education and income gradient. So this is from the ACS. This is just a, this is kind of like a not super representative sample um, from a different project, but you see kind of the relationship that you would expect, which is I'm capping in here looking at hundred thousand dollars, but there's four points, the points in black, which are the, um, I should have labeled them. This is a good example where I should have labeled, I got rid of the legend. So the, the, there's three, there's four sets of dots. It's the, the, the second from the top on this left-hand one is the average. So the, you have the average, um, income within each bin of years of education. The red dots are the 75th percentile. Um, the third dots are the, um, the median. And then this purple line is the 25th percentile. So one thing to notice here, right, is, is there's pretty clear heteroscedasticity. So there's basically um, a lot of spread and the spread really increases as you go up in the education 
Um, this is, should be 17 plus. So, you know, this is basically anyone who does post-secondary college. Um, there's pretty wide variance, right? Especially at high education. This basically, there's a lot of distribution here. I kept it at a million. There's more observations that go up. And so, you know, kind of an interesting aspect of this is if you ran OLS, that's what this blue line is, is you get this very uh, clear positive gradient that comes um, across as you know you have this positive increase. But what's notable is that OLS is really influenced by these tails of the income. So I'm plotting here, I'm gonna zoom in in just a second, but I am plotting here, the blue line is plotting OLS. And then I have the 75th, the median and the 25th percentile um, quantile regression lines. So here it is zoomed back in at $100,000. You can notice it's not just that it's it, it's skewed on the on the right, right? So it's kind of this very interesting problem in that the mean is higher overall, but it's also higher a lot more than the median in different parts of the distribution. So down at the lower parts of the education spectrum, the mean the OLS coefficient is much higher. Um, while it's much closer to the median um, when we go further up. And then what we see is that there's kind of this big spread um, in the quantile distribution. So really kind of the, the piece to take away here is that there's, it's kind of not nearly as influenced by these outliers, especially in the lower part, the, the quantile distribution is kind of getting a much clearer sense of the returns to education um, across this distribution. Okay. So next let's turn to, so I, so far I've really just been talking about kind of estimation, like modeling features of quantile regression. So really what I've told you is it's relatively robust and I've told you it kind of avoids certain problems that show up if say if you're doing OLS, but I haven't really told you how to interpret it. So if you, when you learn OLS, you learn that, okay, well, these are basically um, derivatives of the conditional expectation function. And we can think about if I change the values for one person, here's where they'll move to in terms of their expectation. The expected value for somebody moving from this to this is blah. The problem is, is that quantile regression doesn't have this interpretation. So it's, it's really challenging. So even Conker's book basically punts on this issue. And so I would say it's like an incredible example of passing the buck where he basically says, well, it's true that you can't interpret the quantile regressions in like a causal way for an individual person, but OLS is probably wrong too. So we all want to talk about now why, why this is the case. So let's consider like a binary case. So in the binary context, we have some binary treatment DI. So, um, we're going to be looking at that the same um, NSW program that we were doing um, with Alon previously, where we can think about the OLS version of the model, right? So we can think about YI, and then we have some DI, and so we can estimate this this beta, and this will get us an approximation to the average treatment effect, right? So here's this beta. In that setting, we get about eighteen hundred dollars um, effect here. And so, what's the interpretation of this effect? Well, it's the interpretation is that it's the difference in means of a, for, between a person getting the treatment versus not, how much they would change from going from the control group to the treatment group on average. That's a pretty useful metric, right? For predicting what's gonna happen going forward. Obviously you could condition and do heterogeneous treatment effects. You could do condition, you can condition on characteristics and we could have gotten something more precise. But more generally, this is something that predicts within person what's gonna happen. Well, now, what if I did quantile regression? What is that doing? So what does it mean if you do quantile regression? So previously we were basically comparing the means of two distributions. The two distributions were Y1 and Y0. So these were marginal distributions, right? Or we're basically, we're, we're talking about characteristics of, I get a, I have a sample of Y1s and I have a sample of Y0s. Say we were God and we observed everything and we didn't have the fundamental problem of in, causal inference. And we just observe everything. We're just thinking about two distributions. 
we didn't have to specify anything about the joint distribution of the two. And that's good because the joint distribution isn't fundamentally observable, right? Well, the problem becomes, you know, now if we want to talk about a person sitting at the 75th percentile in the control group, the question becomes, well, say I want to talk about distributional impacts. What is the treatment effect for a person sitting in the 75th percentile that I want to talk about? Because if I want anything that sort of remains individual specific has to then make very strong assumptions about the relationship between the control distribution and the, the treatment distribution, right? So just to make this very concrete, you know, I'm sitting here, we're all in the control group and say I wanted to talk about the impact on the person who's in the 75th percentile. Well, what, what would be a metric that could be useful? And it starts, you start to realize that it's sort of hard to say what that is. Is it that you wanna talk about what the conditional average is for that person? So it's saying like conditional and being in the 75th percentile in the control group, What's my out average outcome? That's a little weird. And more generally, what ends up happening here is you realize that it's very challenging to say something specifically about a person. And instead, what you have to do is you have to describe things more about the overall distribution. So there's really kind of two ways in which people do this, one which is weaker than the other. One is to just say we're comparing things about the distribution. It's not about people per se. But rather what we're saying is, well, what is the effect? What is basically the quantile under the treatment regime at say, you know, tau equals 0.75 versus the quantile and the control regime at the same point in the distribution. So this is what Furpo does in his 2005 paper. Um, this is pretty common. This is really just saying, let's compare parts of the distribution. And that ends up having a lot of power in the sense that you can do a lot. Once you're willing to only be talking about those things, many of the things that we were doing with means kind of followed through. We All we have to do is kind of impute characteristics of the marginal distribution, then we can do um, inverse propensity score weighting in the same way that we did for the means. All, the, all these sort of things show up in the same way. Kind of a st much stronger assumption that would let you do more is to say, okay, we're going to assume what's called rank invariance, which is to say that, say I was in the 75th percentile in the control group, if we moved everyone to the treatment regime, I would also be in the 75th percentile. And you can imagine that's going to let you talk a lot about treat about a lot of things. You can start to say many, many things about how individuals are affected given on where they are, but it's also a really strong assumption, right? Because it really assumes that there's a kind of a rank preservation that um, that persists across this. And this is what's used in this paper by um, Chernozikov and Hansen in 2005 in Econometrica, where they're doing this. Part of the reason they do this is that by pinning that down, you can do IV quantile regression, um, which is kind of would obviously be very nice. You know, we're going to get into this point where we're going to want to use IV. This gets you a lot stronger ways of doing um, IV quantile regression without having to make other assumptions, but it's very hard to envision a world. And I find the rank invariance assumption kind of implausible. So if we think about this, it really requires that there could be heterogeneity in the effect, but that you know the world in which there are these other characteristics above and beyond um, the treatment effect that don't change in the kind of the control and the treatment regimes. Anyway, this is just kind of to point out that it becomes challenging in this setting because the quantiles don't map to individuals or they don't map to kind of summary statistics about individuals. So really, I'm gonna focus on for the rest of today is just talking about um, this first version, which is thinking about parts of the distribution, which is much more common in this space. Um, but the problem is, is that you can't really talk about individual effects. And instead, what you have to do is think about evaluating policies over the full shape of the distribution, right? So now let's look at the effect of um, NSW across the distributions. <clears throat> 
I would say one thing that's kind of remarkable here. So actually, I didn't really elaborate on this and I apologize for that. So what's very common in this is if say you're doing quantile regression, I told you, okay, we're going to talk about quantile regression at the median or at the 75th percentile, but you could imagine doing this for a lot of different percentiles. So in this graph that I just did, I just did it for um, basically 40 different points. I did, and I did them all simultaneously in order to kind of see the range of effects over the distribution. And you could very easily do that in these settings and you can actually talk about the statistical properties of these joint distributions of these characteristics. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I basically bin this out into, I wanna say it's, I wanna say it's 49 or 48 bins. I'm, doing, I'm basically doing 2% bins um, where I estimated it at each point. And what you can kind of see is at the bottom quantiles, there's no effect. And that's because basically both, no, both people had zero income and so it's just degenerate. Nobody moved in that part of the distribution. And then as you move up the quantile, you start to see these effects. And the, the, ver the horizontal line is the OLS estimate. And then we kind of get our quantile estimates across this. And what's kind of notable is that, I would say this is relatively homogenous. There was not this kind of, you, you get, once you get to kind of the 40th percentile, there's this positive effect that's comparable to the OLS estimate. It's kind of sticks around and then it very much at the tail there's this big positive increase as well. And so what's notable is that for the most part, I would say the distributional effects are actually smaller than the OLS estimate because the OLS estimate is kind of boosted by this stuff out, out here in the tail. Um, but what's nice is you can actually start to compare the pointwise estimates across the distribution. So, you know, in terms of how to compare these estimates. The OLS estimate, remember, was around $1,800. It was quite significant. If we do the median one, well, we see an insignificant effect of about $1,000 with the standard error of um, 872. 75th percentile, there's this big positive effect that's significant. And then in the over in the right tail, we get this big positive, even larger effect. The problem is that the standard error is really large in the 95th percentile. You can actually see that here, right? This is a lot of noisiness. So um, some of this is significant, some is not. When you're going to kind of report these results, graphically is kind of the best way to show it. And then you can do some joint um, tests of these quantiles to say what share of them um, are positive. It's You have to be careful on these things because you, know, you may do it for one quantile. And as you can see here, that varies a lot as a function of kind of what the underlying data distribution looks like. Um, and this is maybe another way of kind of seeing this. So one thing to keep in mind from this um, FERPO at all, uh, sorry, just FERPO 2005 paper, this is an econometric paper about um, quantile treatment effects. Um, we're actually, you may or may not be noticing, we're moving through the decades. Now all these papers are in the 2000s. These are things that people cared about in the 2000s. People write less on this topic now. Um, you remember how we kind of learned the inverse propensity score weighting um, estimator to do the average treatment effects. So you can do the same exercise here and it's doing basically a really analogous um, aspect to what we did in um, for the average treatment effect. We can do it for quantile treatment effects where we say, okay, well, what we need is we need to impute the values for the, the quantile in, in um, the treatment regime and the quantile for the control regime. Well, what we do is for the quantile in, in a given regime, it's this up-weighted or down-weighted version of um, this loss function where we're trying to estimate the quantile. We're trying to find the thing that minimizes this up and down-weighted thing. The same way of kind of trying to find um, the mean, we're taking the mean within a group. And then the weights are very analogous. They're just P-score weighted weights. And that this weighted, this weighted sum is exactly kind of the most efficient semi-parametric estimator that you can do. And it's really all it's doing is it's, in, it's backing out parts of the distribution and comparing the two of them. And you actually see that this here. So this is just the same graph, but now instead of um, plotting the, uh, blah, 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 the difference, I'm plotting the underlying marginals, right? So these are, this is a CDF, right? So the CDF, we have the income on the Y, on the X axis. We have the CDF on the Y axis. I always find CDFs confusing because remember the treatment 
shifts things rightwards when it has a positive effect. So the treatment is in, in this green, the control is in red. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and find um, the quantiles in each group and compare the two of them. So it's really trivial here is that what it would do for the 75% quantile, it would just compare the, the horizontal distance at 75. You can kind of see the difference across all across the board and what those regression versions of it were doing is they were just accounting for kind of the uncertainty in the estimation at given points. This is obviously a very compelling way to do it. Um, when you do the inverse propensity score weighted thing is what it's doing is it's constructing a version of this CDF that reweights as a function of the propensity scores to get a better estimate of it. And so if you look at this FERPO et al paper, what he does is the same exercise as in um, the Lalonde paper or not as in, Lalonde, as in the Dehazian Waba paper, but now doing it for quantile regression. And what you do is you can take the same PSID data set, reweight it and be able to kind of construct a control group in the same way. And you can see how it varies across the distribution. Okay, so last example. So I was kind of describing what I was gonna do on this. I had a friend say, well, you know, so what? Like this quantile stuff, like, so what? You know, it's interesting to be able to estimate this range of effects, but there's a bunch of problems, right? It's noisier. I think, uh, hopefully it was clear from just looking at the, this table, right? It's like the OLS estimate is super, is much more efficient in the sense that we get this point estimate that's highly significant. And for these ones, it's kind of, you have to find the right quantile to kind of find something that looks significant. That's one thing, it's noisier, um, in part because you have to do this, this bootstrapping or kernel estimation. It's challenging to interpret in a, an intuitive way. And then third, I didn't list it here, but a third thing is like, is this really that interesting? It kind of just shifts everyone by X hundreds of dollars. Most programs that are doing this are kind of just shifting everyone. And so OLS is probably capturing the vast majority of what you want to do. So what you really want to use for this is if you have an underlying theory that has really implications for the distribution and who's going to benefit and who's not, this is maybe a really nice empirical approach for you. And so there's a paper by um, Marianne Bittler, Jonah Gelbach, and Hilary Hoynes that kind of highlights this point exactly. And this is what we're going to do for our last example. So in this paper, this is in the AER in 2006, they are um, comparing two programs. So I'll be honest, I don't actually know if Ilsa is here. She might know these things better than me. But the, so I'm not gonna mis misspeak when I say this, but there's a big shift in kind of the labor pro in the subsidies that we had for um, in basically changing welfare programs in the, in the 90s. And um, there was a lot of interest in trying to evaluate them. And one of the big things that people, that kind of the shifts were trying to do was to try and encourage um, an increase in, uh, in labor, basically labor supply. So have things that induced uh, more uh, labor supplied. What this paper was trying to do is compare a program called Jobs First that was actually here in Connecticut and this program called AFDC, which is, I'm gonna blank on the name, something for families with dependent children, um, assistance for families with dependent children, where they basically had very different, um, they had different incentives. And so there was actually some amount of randomization on who got to use the Jobs First program. And the Jobs First program, there are a lot of differences, but kind of the most important one for what we're gonna look at today was there was a significantly larger and more generous tax treatment in the Jobs First program. And so this graph kind of really nicely describes it. So this is kind of a very stylized budget constraint where you have work supplied like labor supply on the x-axis and income on the y-axis where there are a bunch of things that happened under these programs so under both programs there was a subsidy if you didn't work at all you got a subsidy so that's at work hours equals zero there was kind of this subsidy here up to a certain point and then um that subsidy basically continued or but was phased out over time um and there's kind of two sets of lines. I wish they had done these in different colors. This is from the paper itself. So the from A to B and then going upwards along this is what 
is under AFDC. So what happens is, is that there is basically for an initial amount of money that you're working, you have um, your you get basically ta- don't get taxed on this money. So the there's limited tax take from it, and so as a consequence, you're getting more money. This is you up to point B, and then you're kind of back at this um, at this budget constraint. Whereas the jobs first program didn't tax at all up until you made enough money to hit the federal poverty line. So once you hit the federal poverty line, it started taxing you um, for money above that. So there's actually this immediate drop and then you went back to this initial budget constraint. So really the difference between the two programs is that um, this outer line is the jobs first program. And what it did was it shifted the tax incentives. So there was substantially more um, beneficial tax incentive for people. And so they they would just get more money when they worked in these programs. Um, What's interesting about this though, is it has really interesting implications for depending on where you would have been in the control group, the AFDC program, what you would do and what your monthly income would look like. So in the very, very bottom, so if you can think about this, these points um, A all the way to H are basically um, points where you could have been under the control group. And then we think about what would happen if you got switched into um, the jobs first program. Well, on the A, which is where you're at the very bottom, there's really not going to be any impact. Um, if you're very, very bottom of it, you really you weren't all giving any labor supply and sort of the increase there isn't going to, to do anything. You are already kind of optimally getting um, your, uh, your benefits there. At the very top, where if people who are at eight or above, you know, there's one of two effects that's going to happen to your income. There's either going to be no effect, which is that, you know, you aren't going to re-optimize even though this new budget curve is here because your basically labor leisure trade-off is such that you don't care about this additional restriction here, or it might be negative, right? So if you actually dislike work enough, you might end up hitting this F point or some part of this curve, right? Depending on your labor leisure trade-off. And then for everybody in between who are kind of on these points, it's kind of an unambiguous shift outwards that you're going to increase your monthly income because... You'd much rather be on this point where you get more money um, potentially for uh, with lower taxes. Any question on that? I know there's a lot in there and I have to say, frankly, the paper is kind of confusing, but I think I described it. More or less, there's basically, there's this strong incentive to work, tax rates are low. For people who are at the very bottom and just getting the subsidy, the new program doesn't do anything. For people in the middle, it should be positive. And there's this question of, well, will it have an impact at the top? And it'll either have a zero or potentially negative. And obviously the higher up your income was under the control, the more like it has a zero effect. So what does the result look like? Well, it's actually pretty remarkable. So this is just, they have a lot of stuff in here. We're just gonna focus on the income aspect. Well, this is the quantile regression. So for the vast majority of these people, there's nothing that happens. They're all at the zeros. These are all working um, moms who have dependent children. They are basically staying on the subsidy and they're not um, going to be uh, working more under either plan. That's consistent with the model. Then we see this large positive increase. So the way that this works is the black line is the quantile effect. And then they have their, um, they have their uh, 95, uh, 90% confidence intervals. And what they show, so then we have this positive increase. And then what's really, I think, notable and, and interesting is that you then get this negative impact up in the upper part of the distribution, exactly consistent with the implications of the static labor supply model. And then it actually goes back up again, where these are the people who really should have kind of a zero impact. So you get this really kind of interesting nonlinear relationship that's predicted by the theory and kind of has implications for how you think about um, who wins and who loses in this. Any questions on that? Um, So let me kind of wrap up. Um, Let me talk about the upsides of quantile regression before I talk about the downsides. So what I'm hoping you take away from this is the upsides is it really lets you characterize the distribution in kind of a really interesting way, um, both under treatment effects. We were really just doing kind of binary treatment effects, but there's no reason to think you can't think about multi-value treatment effects or even continuous things 
um, in the same way. Uh, this can be really useful for considering welfare, like when you want to think about the whole distribution of who's benefiting, who's losing. Um, it can be uh, important when you're thinking about models and you have sort of more complicated models that are going to have implications that are nonlinear across the distribution. We're going to try and revisit this when we're thinking about hierarchical models and shrinkage more generally. Um, another really powerful aspect of this that I hope I emphasized enough is that it's pretty robust. It's robust to these issues of functional form, like taking the log or not. It's robust to these censoring issues. And it's really robust to this outlier problem. And it's really worth having in your toolkit along with OLS in a lot of applications. This, you know, not hard to do. These are both pretty much default in Stata and R um, to at least do the bare minimum of this to check a few of these things. Um, it's really quite straightforward to do and I think can add a lot to your paper potentially. The downsides, I, I do view there being downsides and I frankly, it's not something that I do all the time in my papers, although I probably should. Um, it's not the fastest thing in the world. So I had multiple times last night where I was trying to get in these graphs and figures ready. And I like used a big data set as opposed to a smaller one. And then my computer was frozen for 30 seconds because I was doing this bootstrapping with a million observation data set. And it's just not a super fast, you know, the linear programming thing is quite fast, but it's not instantaneously fast. And more importantly, the standard errors are not fast. Um, and as a consequence that means it's like harder to do things um, quickly or kind of do some simple analyses. Another thing is that quantile regression isn't, you can't do additive combinations of things. It's not possible to decompose estimates in the same way that you might intuitively do. So imagine income is a function of salary and transfers. Well, you can't talk about the estimates in salary and the estimates in transfers and then directly compare those estimates. Um, because it's not an additive, um, it's not an additive model in the same way that it is with uh, the expectation with the standard OLS. Um, in OLS, if you ran a regression on Y1 and ran a regression on Y2, the sum of the coefficients would get you what it looks like for Y. You would be able to really talk about decomposing things. This is, you know, we do this for things like um, Oaxaca blinder decomposition, et cetera, and it becomes harder to do that. There's work that looks at this but it's non-trivial to do those sorts of things. It's not off the shelf. This also becomes a big issue when thinking about fixed effects. So fixed effects add a whole new layer of problems. Um, I didn't talk about them today, but it's worth looking at Conker's book if this is something you're interested in. I will say that this kind of was problematic for me in some of my applications. Um, again, sort of this interpretation issue that Leland and I just talked about a little bit is, you know, it's challenging to interpret these things as structural parameters in the same way. Um, I think the right way to think about it is to don't think about the parameters themselves and instead think about kind of constructing counterfactual versions of distributions is really what this is trying to do. Um, you change covariates, it lets you think about how the, co the full distribution of things changes. Change, you know, this is like a, uh, feel like I'm like trying to do like a mantra or like power thinking, like change your estimate, like change the way that you think about things. If you're going to use this, don't think about this as the parameter itself, but think about, well, what does that imply over the whole distribution? Um, and then the last thing I already mentioned this a little bit is like standards can be wonky. I didn't even really get into this. The asymptotic theory is starting to get there, but you know, when I was in graduate school, it was, you couldn't really cluster. Clustering was not a thing. So now, you know, uh, there's this really nice paper by Hogman, um, Andreas Hogman at Michigan, where you can do bootstrapping with clustering, no problem. It's kind of off the shelf now. But in my defense, this it was not available in graduate school. Um, so, and I didn't graduate that long ago. So this is like, I would say that, you know, in simple settings where you have a treatment that is relatively well-defined, this is a pretty doable thing. Um, in more complicated, settings, this can be quite challenging. Um, and that's pretty much it. Right on time. Does anyone have any questions?